Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We've uncovered a track here that hasn't seen the light of day for 112 million years. It has the feeling of a much more secluded, more wilderness type area once you're on the trail. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is starting a statewide voluntary hunter safety training program. I was here for the entire duration. When the fire actually approached, it was extremely intense. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Doing what's right and good, regardless of the degree of difficulty, takes guts. Those are the people who build Ram Trucks. Ram. They've been extinct for millions of years. But thanks to human imagination and a bit of exploitation from pop culture, dinosaurs have made a comeback. They're, uh, they're flocking this way. Most writers and filmmakers will admit their reimagination of dinosaurs isn't especially true to life. And that brings us to our real life cast of characters in their own real life adventure. He's ready. Okay. Mark North, 66.84. Mike O'Brien is a graphics designer with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. As long as you're getting material out of there, yeah, keep scraping it. You need to start getting your gear together and... Dr. James Farlow is a professor of paleontology from Indiana. With a grant from the National Geographic Society, he's brought 21 students and volunteers nearly a thousand miles to sweep, swab, and swelter under the hot summer sun. We're gonna have a great opportunity today to get these recorded in 3D. So clear. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it gorgeous? Awesome. That's just a beautiful shot up there. Oh yeah. Isn't that cool? Very. That's the payoff for all this work we go through. Ready? If I can get this done and see it out there, a bunch of Google Earth files that people can interact with and plan their trip out here and, you know, know where things are. Did it skip its track? Yeah, I think he's heading that way. Uh, the one immediately by Mike's left hand looks like it's a right. Five, five, four, nine. Each number you hear will become a GPS coordinate that corresponds to a specific dinosaur track. Okay, ready? North, 76.267. The process can be excruciatingly slow, taking hours and sometimes days, depending on how many tracks are being mapped. Sometimes I get bogged down in the mechanics and the details and the drudgery of some of what has to be done to document them, but every once in a while, you sit back and reflect and, and you get that sense of wonder about what it is you are actually seeing when you see footprints made one after another by living dinosaurs. That's as close to seeing a living dinosaur going about its activities as you're going to get. And so that can't help but fire the imagination. After the GPS coordinates are recorded, Mike O'Brien takes a photo of each individual dinosaur track. That's one thing about this, this is not easy. It seems like everything is, is a challenge. And when the photographs, GPS coordinates, and Google Earth files are all combined, the result is this. 
I've got hundreds of, of photographs. I bring all those back here and I'm able to stitch all those photographs together and we got some great photo mosaics of it. The blue tracks are a small sauropod. These red tracks are a pretty big acrocanthosaur and you can see this green line and how all of a sudden he goes from here, here, that's a left foot, right foot, left, and then all of a sudden he turns real hard right here. It, it really tells quite a story and it's really important to capture it now before it's, before it's gone. What Mike means is the moment the tracks are unearthed, they'll slowly erode away. Now we can preserve a digital file so they will be able to do a tour of this track site on their computers. But any amount of modern day effort pales compared to what happened at this same site back in 1939. Roland T. Bird was a paleontologist who hit the mother low here along the Paluxy River, discovering hundreds of theropod tracks along with the first known evidence of sauropods. But Bird didn't just scientifically document the tracks, he dug up a huge section and hauled it off to museums across the country. Almost overnight, the city of Glenrose became famous throughout the world. The following morning, did you see this one we just found? Mike made an incredible find. This, one, this is probably the deepest theropod track that's come out of the park. We've uncovered a track here that hasn't seen the light of day for 112 million years. I mean, give or take a few million. It's pristine, that's very deep. Well, this thing goes on forever. I think it's probably time to put some water in here, soften it up. Thank you. Oh, I thought this was to drink. <laughs> you can, but I wouldn't. <laughs> I was going, it's lemonade. All right, thank you. For the next day and a half, Mike will work to get every last bit of clay separated from this fossilized theropod track. You may want to back up for this. I'm going to blast that track out. <laughs> You're a mess. What blows my mind is seeing those individual toes. It just gives you so much more depth of information. If you can email a file or you can post it on a website for everyone to look at, you know, so many opportunities for sharing that information, especially if you're working with colleagues studying dinosaur trackways in other parts of the world. Having all this new technology has really opened some new doors. The remnants of real life dinosaurs may not be visually stimulating like the ones created by special effects artists, but the ones here at Dinosaur Valley State Park have a huge advantage going for them. They were real. Well, if the payoff is not worth the effort, I'm one of the biggest idiots on the planet. So yeah, I think the payoff is worth the effort. As long as those tracks are mapped, imagine how many more trails that'll lead us down and the stories they're gonna tell us. Jeff Sparks, I'm the State Parks Wildland Fire Program Manager. You good with that? 
I manage wildland fires or wildfires on our state parks as well as prescribed fires uh, for habitat management purposes. In 2005, we began to transition into more what I'm going to call a professional organization. By adopting these national standards, we were now utilizing the same training, equipment, and qualification standards that firefighters were using throughout the United States. He is actually the person in state parks who took all of these resources and melded them into a seamless, uh, professional, wildland firefighting cadre. An ember fell in the crotch of that juniper tree. During 2011, we maintained a very high state of preparedness. We had nearly 200 wildland firefighters and seven engines that were ready to be dispatched at any given time to fight fires that were threatening state parks. He has had a vision and his leadership has really taken the program to another level. And it's really helped us in these extreme situations like the wildfires we've had in 2011. I was here for the entire duration. When the fire actually approached, it was extremely intense. At times there were 50, 60, even 100 foot flame lengths actually approaching many of our structures. So our progressive hose lay actually comes up the hill from the lake, and at each structure we'll have a Y that breaks out and will totally surround the house with hoses so that firefighters can stand and uh, protect the structure as the fire approaches. So we had a good defensible space around each cabin. Are y'all up? Tired. Yeah. Very tired. During the Bass Drop Fire, all of our state parks and wildlife division staff fighting the fire actually worked as a very cohesive team. Um, we had great communication between all levels. Heroes we were not. We were doing our job. You copy? It's the fall, it's a nice lazy lake to be on, it's cool, nice little campfire, keep you warm when it does get a little chilly at night. Nice peaceful park. Hidden away in a rolling valley southwest of Fort Worth is Cleburne State Park. We're 30 minutes, 40 minutes away from the Metroplex and it's a super place to come to come and relax and enjoy a weekend. The clear creeks and dense woods made the area an ideal spot for Native Americans and Chisholm Trail cowboys to camp and rest. Some of these trees have, you know, the little blue berries. They're actually cones. Ranger-led hikes introduce visitors to the park's history and habitat. The Indians ate the flowers off. They burned the thorns up, and then they did the not everyone who visits the park today is here to relax. Those fit okay? Yeah, I got little hands. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Jim Hickman and his father own the totally spoked bike shop in nearby Cleburne. They lead regular rides on the park's six plus miles of trails. Cleburne, yeah, that's where we all ride. You don't feel that you're so close to the city or that you're so close to Fort Worth. It has the feeling of a much more secluded, more wilderness type area once you're on the trails. You're winding through the trees and you can kind of escape for a little bit from the fact that you're only 10 minutes from work. <laughs> it's a nice escape. He's just down there laying on the bottom, nibbling that liver off around the hook. The centerpiece of Cleburne State Park is 116-acre Cedar Lake. Been here, coming here since I was a little boy. I like it out here. Real nice and peaceful and pretty out here. Another good one. A lot of fish. On a good day, a lot of fish. The park was largely built by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. You can see names and dates in the mortar work and the rock work and the cement work they've done here at the park. 80 years and it's still standing. It's really cool. Cleburne State Park is a little off the beaten path. But once you find it, chances are you'll come back. This park is hidden. It's nice. It's quiet. 
you can canoe, fish, mountain bike, hike, enjoy camping. Just kick back and relax and not do a thing. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department was created 50 years ago when the Game and Fish Commission and State Parks Board were merged. To mark this anniversary, we take a look through the archives to see how things have changed and stayed the same across the decades. Do you know why you point a shotgun but aim a rifle? Are you a sportsman who handles guns safely? If so, the young people in your community need you. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is starting a statewide voluntary hunter safety training program. We need a large group of volunteer instructors to share their knowledge to avoid gun accidents while hunting. Qualified instructors will be certified and will receive credentials and identification. The department will send you manuals and other teaching aids. For additional information, contact the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. This is a beautiful little gun. Let's go quietly now, Macy. This is a good looking spot. I have four daughters. Macy is my outdoors person, so she likes to go and tromp out in the woods as long as the bugs don't bother her too much. Come on, on this side of the tree. Joe Davis and his daughter Macy are hunting on the Gus Engling Wildlife Management Area. It's in the heart of East Texas, with over 2,000 acres of pristine hardwood forest. This is a beautiful place, and the squirrel habitat I hadn't seen like this since I was a kid hunting in South Alabama. I'm not sure I saw. Be sure he's dead before you pick him up. I know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That other squirrel has got to be right here. Dad, put it in your pocket. Which one? This one? Whoa. That's cool. Seen squirrels and a hog, heard crows and woodpeckers and all kinds of things. But we kill, how many did we kill this morning? Four. Four? I think that may be right. Three. Fifteen? I think we killed fifteen this morning, didn't we? No. <laughs> In years past, a youngster learned woodsmanship and hunting skills with small game, like rabbit and squirrel. It wasn't so much a sport as a practical means of feeding the family. Many movies have portrayed small game hunting for what it once was. A rite of passage as kids grew to teenagers. Look at Paul. These here's for your supper, and only wasted two shots. It's mighty fine, Sam. I'm taking charge, all right, ain't I, Pa? Everything's coming along just fine. 
Fast forward a hundred years or so, and the things that made hunting such a socially acceptable and necessary part of our survival have faded away. Take the birds. The result, each year we have fewer and fewer young hunters. And each year, our ties to nature weaken ever so slightly. Oh, take your time, son. This is a dying thing, all these hardwood bottoms. You don't see this much anymore. I like the hardwood bottoms. Lots of squirrels. It'd be better if I could shoot straight. Let's see why I'm pointing right here. See his limb coming down right here. I'm gonna walk around. You watch him coming on this side. He's right up at the top. Now, you've been a pretty good boy, both my boys. Turned out pretty good. And I think hunting has a lot to do with it. spending time with them doing anything. Good shot. <laughs> yeah, he finally got one. <laughs> what you got? Another little cat squirrel roaming the trees. I'm getting me a squirrel before we go home. Huh? I'm getting me a squirrel before we go home tomorrow. For a squirrel, a mature hardwood forest is a big grocery store stocked with berries, acorns, and pecans. A healthy hardwood ecosystem also creates something akin to a huge squirrel condominium, providing den sites for females to raise and shelter their young. But quality habitats like the one at Ingling are rare. Many of the old growth hardwoods have been cut down and replaced with huge pine plantations. It's not so much that we have fewer trees, we have fewer of the hardwood trees that create the food to support a diverse wildlife population. Biologists talk about monocultures and how monocultures can be considered wildlife deserts. But when you have the diversity that we have on England, you're providing lots of different kinds of habitat types. Diversity is a key for wildlife. Macy's eyes are a little sharper than mine. She can look up in the tree and say, there's one. And I say, where? She said, right there. He's got to move pretty good before I see him. He's going up the tree. I don't see him. You don't see any of them. There he is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a little too far. Did you say you saw one? Biscuit and gravy and squirrels that we have in mind. Uh, I may take some to my dad. He lives in Mississippi and he loves them and he'll cook them for me. I'm not sure if my wife will cook them or not. The population of most wildlife species depends largely on the quantity and quality of the habitat. That's why squirrels are so plentiful here at England. But as the hardwood bottom lands across East Texas disappear, the tradition of hunting squirrel, a practice passed from generation to generation, could disappear as well. I hope she just remember spending time with her dad. He was way up in that tree, wasn't he? I did that with my dad and remember those days and I have great memories and I think it's the same thing with her. And Joe Davis hopes Macy's generation won't be the last of the squirrel hunters. The annual public hunting permit provides access to low-cost hunting opportunities on nearly 1.2 million acres of land including the Gus Engling Wildlife Management Area. For more info, log on to our website.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Doing what's right and good, regardless of the degree of difficulty, takes guts. Those are the people who build Ram Trucks. Ram.